next on Unsolved Mysteries. When a Colorado man is found riddled with bullets, his wife becomes the main suspect. This man, George Anderson, claims he can communicate with the dead. Why do I feel as if I lose my air? We put him to the test. In Atlanta, a serial bomber terrorizes an entire city. Police race to bring him down before he strikes again. Also, a strange new twist in the tragic death of a young, aspiring journalist. Our viewers have helped solve hundreds of cases just like these, and perhaps you can too. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. Lookout Mountain, just outside of Denver. The site of a popular religious shrine. A man notices a blue Buick parked on the roadside. The driver's window is shattered, so the man takes a closer look. Inside is a body riddled with bullets. The dead man was Mark Grosinger, a 29-year-old concrete cutter from the nearby town of Golden. Mark had no known enemies. When inconsistencies turned up during the murder investigation, his wife became the prime suspect. I don't think anyone disliked him. He was a very nice guy. He'd help you do anything, and he was kind of shy. But for a friend, you know, he was a real good friend to people. There were few clues found at the crime scene. It appeared that Mark had been shot from the passenger side of the car. A paper bag filled with 38 caliber bullets was found on the right front floorboard. We also have empty shell casings here in the front seat. There were casings inside and outside of the car, enough to indicate that the gun had been reloaded at least twice during the shooting. There were also other intriguing clues. We recovered the wallet, his driver's license, with money that he had in the wallet. So we basically ruled out a robbery. But the thing that really was strange is that the car keys were missing. And if there was a robbery, they would have taken the wallet, left the car keys. To investigators, Mark's murder appeared to be a crime of passion. Well, taking in consideration the number of bullets that were fired into Mark's body, it's clear to us that this is a killing of, of rage, uh, of fury, of hate, revenge. Judy, why don't you uh, tell us about Mark's activities on that last Friday night? Investigators questioned Mark's wife, Judy. She had already reported him missing. When we got finished, he said he felt like going out to play some pool. I said I didn't really want to go. I didn't feel like it. Judy said that on the night Mark was killed, they had eaten dinner at a local restaurant with a friend. Judy wasn't feeling well. It's early, so why don't we go ahead and go out and shoot some pool? Oh, honey, you better not. I just didn't get home. I'll go back with you. Judy said Mark took her home around 8 o'clock. Her friend decided to keep her company. We left. Uh, he stopped at a liquor store, picked up a bottle of whiskey and dropped us off in front of the house and took off. And what time did Mark drop you off? There seemed to be several discrepancies in Judy Grossinger's story. OK. I'll see you all later. Bye. Judy indicated that they went back to their residence approximately 8 o'clock, and then Mark left to shoot pool. But we contacted people that were going up to the shrine to a wedding rehearsal that evening. They told us that they observed Mark's car there uh, by the gate at 8 p.m. So we had a problem there with that story. 
Detectives didn't find a gun at the crime scene that matched the 38 caliber shells. When they ran a check of all the 38 caliber guns recently purchased in the Denver area, they recognized one name, Judy Grossinger. She had purchased a weapon in Denver at a pawn shop three days prior to Mark's death. And we asked her why she didn't tell us this initially. She said she forgot. Mark came home one day and he asked me if I could go to the pawn shop the next day and buy a gun for um, somebody. And I asked him why the person didn't buy it themselves. He said they were just a little underage or something of that sort. So I went down to Denver and I looked around and picked out the kind of gun he wanted, a 38. This is good. I'll take it. You working here last week? Detectives yes, checked was. out her story. On April 3rd, this woman came in here to buy a gun. Do you recognize her or the guy she's with? I recognize the lady. I don't recognize the gentleman. She was with the man, though. She was? Yes. Can you describe him to me? A uh, biker guy, long hair. He was wearing a cap. The cap. proprietors of the pawn shop were very adamant about the fact that there was a man with Judy Grossinger in that pawn shop that day. Nice While guy. she was picking out this gun, uh, she called this male subject over to her and said, words to the effect of, what about this one? Do you like this one? Those type of words. Detectives found another major discrepancy in Judy Grosinger's account. Part of Judy's story was that after she and Mark had finished dinner, they drove to a liquor store near their residence to buy a bottle of whiskey. Detectives again checked out Grossinger's story. We're investigators from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Do you know the people in this picture? Yes, I do. That's Mark and Judy Grossinger. The lady yeah. says, I know Mark personally, and I know Judy. And no, Mark did not come in by whiskey that particular night. I did not see Mark come in here. I did see Judy and some guy, though, a couple days ago. The guy here in the store? Yeah. Why don't you describe this guy to me? Well, he was tall and dark hair, bikerish looking. That person told us Judy came into the liquor store at a later time with another man, matching the description of the man that Judy was with at the pawn shop. So we have two locations where Judy was seen with the same unidentified man. In Mark's car, investigators found a six pack of beer, but the receipt showed that it was purchased from a different store. Judy Grossinger's fingerprints were on one of the bottles of beer. Pack of beer. Now, is that when you went home, or is that the time you left the restaurant? Investigators brought in the only person who could verify Judy's alibi, the friend who had stayed with her after Mark dropped her off at home. She said that she had watched TV with Judy until around midnight and then slept over on the couch. We interviewed friends and acquaintances, and more than one acquaintance said that the relationship was more than just friends. The day after Mark's murder, Judy's friend moved in with her. After living together for a few years, they bought a house. Well, anytime you have a good friend, people start rumoring that that's not true. Sure, we're close friends, but not in that way. Especially in a way you're going to take somebody out and kill them, because what would we have gained by it? There was no reason for me to do that. We have no concrete evidence uh, to place her there that night in that car. All we have is circumstantial evidence that indicates that she may be deceitful in some of her statements. We just don't know. Judy, why don't you... Uh, Judy Grossinger maintains her innocence. She even took a lie detector test, which supported her story. But the discrepancies remain, and Judy Grossinger is still considered a person of interest. All that is known for certain is that, at the moment, Mark's killer is a free man or woman. Next, this man claims to have psychic abilities. Can he really communicate with the dead? Gotta forgive.
The man you're about to meet, George Anderson, seems to have an uncanny ability to communicate with spirits of the dead. I know you may be skeptical, but after seeing Anderson in action, you might just change your mind. At times, it does seem, even for me, that I am literally listening to them or listening to a conversation or feeling I'm listening. I don't want people to get the impression it's all like I'm hearing clearly as I'm hearing you right now. It's a feeling that you're seeing, a feeling that you're hearing, a sensation more. It's like getting an electrical charge all through yourself. I was hosting a popular late night radio talk show. We uh, dealt heavily with unexplained phenomena. When Joel Martin first heard of George Anderson, he had his doubts. And that just, we'll let the spirits do the work. Joel Martin called George Anderson in for a reading. They had never met before. George says he knew nothing about Martin's background. When George conducts readings, he sometimes makes random marks on a pad to help with his concentration. The full name. Father vibration? Uh, no. Uh, no. Father figure? And he no. started to talk about Shirley, my late wife, who had been killed the year before. She was hit and killed by a car crossing a street in New York. Shirley. Sh Shirley, does that name mean something to you? She says you know her. Uh, she's recently passed on suddenly. Uh, she points to her face and, and to her head, uh, pain. Uh, maybe something happened that uh, I'm feeling. Uh, the pain is coming through me. I'm feeling pain in the head and the face. She, um, it may be a car accident. Uh, how, do, how do you know that? Well, she's standing right behind you. Oh, no, no, you, you can't see her. <laughs> you, I, only I can see her. She's a spirit. She's, she's right there. Then he did something that could not be explained by any, any way that I could reason. She, she's pointing her finger. She's, she's waving it back and forth very quickly. Very Whenever quickly, she like was annoyed at me, she would say, you're like a little boy. You're just like a little... But that was only a private thing that she and I knew. Nobody would have known that. So now I'm figuring out how the heck I could not have told that to anybody. There's no way he could have known this or, or should have known it. That's a very private thing. Also, there's another male, you lose a male friend. Joel persuaded George Anderson to undergo tests at a New York City hospital. According to Joel, George's EEG was extremely unusual. While George conducted a session with an off-screen subject, half of his brain registered sleep, while the other half showed normal waking patterns. The neurologist who conducted those tests, he said he had never seen anything like it before. And is it what we expect to see? No. Is it what's supposed to happen? No. Is something unusual going on? Yes. George Anderson has come to accept his unusual ability. He says that it began when he was just six years old, after a severe case of chickenpox. Suddenly, he could hear voices and see visions of people who had recently passed away. Barbara and John Licata contacted George Anderson four months after the death of their 16-year-old son, David. David had gone out to a party. He had to be in by 12.30. I went to bed, but I laid there awake because I don't sleep until my kids are in. And at 1.30, I got up because it was unlike David not to call. David? Mr. Licata? Yes? This is Licata. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to you about your son. And then I knew. Stop. It was um, a night of hell. David had been killed by a hit and run driver. Barbara fell into a deep depression over David's death. At Barbara's request, her husband agreed to a session with George Anderson. Anderson claims that with the Lakatas, as with all his clients, he had no prior information about the family. He only knew they were in mourning. Have you recently lost a son? Yes. Um, some sort of accident. He's telling me. He, it's very confusing because he's very restless. Was he very emotional? <laughs> yes. Very emotional. Yes. Because he's, he's talking a mile a minute. I, 
I can recall their son David coming through very strongly, very high-spirited personality, no pun intended, and uh, also very anxious to reach out to his parents to give them and his family the assurance that he was all right. There were a lot of things, very specific pieces of information that came forth in this reading that there was no way that George could have known. So 16, was he about 16? Yeah, he was 16. He's saying, forgive, gotta forgive. Um, if, if he can forgive, everybody else should be able to forgive because he's the one over there. I felt this enormous relief when we made contact with David through George because I felt like you arrived, you're in the other world, you're still alive, and I will see you again. Six years after David Licata died, 17-year-old David Elliott was killed in a snow skiing accident. The deaths of the two boys became oddly connected when David Elliott's father, John, bought a book about George Anderson called We Don't Die. The book dealt with the case of David Licata. John says that at the time he was reading it, he dreamed that he had a session with George Anderson. The dream seemed so real that I decided I ought to pursue a reading with George. My background is in science and engineering. Uh, I need the hard facts. And so I wanted a number of things out of any, vision, any trip to George to convince myself that he was doing something like what's claimed in his book. Next, George Anderson's psychic powers are put to the test. Shortly after 17-year-old David Elliott was killed in a skiing accident, his father, John, decided to attend a reading with psychic George Anderson, who claims that he can communicate with the dead. Water, so just exercise Two caution. of his other sons, Mark and Jack, were with him. John Elliott claims that Anderson had no idea who they were or that they were his sons. And I decided I would sit back and be the skeptic and give him no information. You prove it to me. The man in the back, uh, you've had a son pass recently? Uh, yes. Um, he's saying... Oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've lost the signal. I wanted to see that there was a signal involved. And he goes, I have to stop now. I lose the signal, quote, signal, uh, when lightning storms arrive. And I sat there, like, with my pen checking off number one. There's a signal involved. Uh, it, it, it's not real clear, but something about 17? He, he, 17, does that mean anything? Yeah. His age? Yes. He was 17 when he passed? Pass suddenly? Yeah. George Anderson's attention then shifted to one of John Elliott's other sons. Do you have, uh, does the, do you take the name Madel Madeline? Yes, uh-huh. A mother vibration, maybe grandmother? Uh-huh, yeah. Grandfather da Donald? Yes. They're, they're around you now. Now your grandparents are moving over behind this young man here. Uh, they're saying they're protecting. Are you two brothers? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Yes. They're saying yes. Uh, I'm seeing some sort of bas a hoop or uh, and a ball, maybe uh, basketball. Uh, and then Mark spoke up at soccer. I play soccer. Oh, OK. Now I understand, because I'm seeing, all of a sudden, I'm seeing David Licata is there, uh, dressed in his soccer uniform. I'm seeing David Licata. Uh, He's, he's wearing his soccer out. He's, the, he's here as a clue. The, the, name, the name David and, and soccer. Um, you're David, you're father of these two boys. Yes, I am. And you, you've lost a, now it's, now he's coming, to, okay. You've lost a son named David. You've lost a brother named David. Finally, he's coming through. I didn't, boy, that was freak. I didn't know why David Licata I, I've, I've, is there. He's saying yes. Now, now your son is coming through. I'm sitting They're there having George life. relive my dream. Very clever, but very freaky. I sat there and was amazed, and I came away without being able to doubt him. 
I definitely have changed my attitude towards a life after this. Over the years, I've learned to accept and believe that David, as well as all the rest of my relatives, are with us all the time. John Elliott was convinced that George Anderson had actually communicated with his dead son. But could Anderson demonstrate his abilities with cameras rolling? At our request, George Anderson agreed to conduct a session with our cameras present. Barry Silverman died at the age of 33, a victim of lung cancer. Barry's parents and his sister Joy agreed to participate in the session. Anderson knew nothing about the family or how Barry had passed away. He said before you had something to do with health. This, well, there's definitely two male presences around you, and I'm sure there's two males close to you passed on someplace, so don't say anything. Let me just go with it. Someone also claims to be your dad. Your dad passed also? Yes, because somebody's on your behind you. Does your, your father have a good sense of humor? Because he joked. He said um, he doesn't want you to feel left out. He claims your boy is with him. So you obviously must have lost a son, because he keeps saying your boy is with me, and I'm sure he passed on as a young adult, but he's still your son, he's still your boy. I hear the name Barry. Um, does the name Barry mean anything yes, to you? that's our son. Barry. This is the message Barry. that I just gave you. Come, this is how you'll know it's for real, that it comes from Barry. <laughs> Why do I feel as if I lose my air? Does that make sense? Yes. The injury I much. feel is in here. Right. And he said, you lose your, I'm losing my air. So there's like pressure in my chest as if I'm injured in the chest, but I'm obviously feeling whatever the circumstances are. Very sensitive, warm guy. He sends his love to the three of you. <laughs> As he says to you specifically now, when you leave, it's like he's giving orders. He says, when you leave here, you leave here with peace. He says, you didn't fail me. And he says, now you stop feeling guilty. And he says, you let that go and put your heart at rest. He says, because he's all right, he's at peace. And with that, he withdraws with the others, pray for us until we meet again, and there they go. OK, you can relax the way they went. I feel a lot better, I really do. I feel that Barry's really with us and, and you know, we'll be together someday and, uh, you know, don't, that doubt is, you know, human beings are funny. I guess you never get rid of it completely, but I feel much more convinced. And I do believe he spoke with George Anderson and there's so many things that he has told us that was so true that I, I feel so much better. I, I feel very relieved. And there are the times where you know something is happening that you cannot explain, plus when you see the effect it has on the people in a positive way where it helps them. I guess it's my job to mind my own business and stay out of it and just continue to be the instrument and let the person receive what comfort comes from it. And that's what I try to do. Coming up, a series of bombings terrorize Atlanta. Will the bomber be arrested before striking again? Atlanta, Georgia, the 1996 Summer Olympics. A clinic in suburban Atlanta. A gay and lesbian nightclub in Midtown Atlanta. Three seemingly unrelated bombings that authorities believe have a common link. Could the same man be behind each attack? Investigators began piecing together forensics from the explosions. They soon discovered that the bombings were linked, but they were puzzled by the random nature of the targets and the motive. Fallon Stubbs and her mother, Alice Hawthorne, were visiting from Albany, Georgia. The last minute trip was a 14th birthday gift for Fallon. We were enjoying the moment, enjoying the people. 
it was an experience like no other. And you know, from to be in that kind of surroundings, it was a beautiful thing. Let me get your picture. Okay. Fallon and her mother stopped to take a picture. One, two, three. The huge explosion knocked Fallon and her mother to the ground. After the explosion, it was it was chaos. You never forget that moment afterwards. And I ran towards anybody who could help. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And I was like, my mother, my mother, somebody's got to help my mother. 44-year-old Alice Hawthorne was killed instantly by flying shrapnel. Hundreds of others were injured. A task force of federal and state investigators was quickly formed to find a terrorist behind this vicious attack. Over the next seven months, two more bombings. But an even more disturbing trend had developed. The bomber was now planting a second device apparently designed to harm police and rescue workers who responded to the first explosion. We're building a good prosecutable court case based upon the forensic evidence we had where we could tie the bombs together, but we still didn't know the identity of the bomber. We didn't know who he was. After the third incident, authorities received letters from the so-called Army of God claiming responsibility for the last two bombings. In the letters, he got into the components of the bomb, which had not been made public at that time, so we knew the letters were written by the bomber. Those who participate in any way in the murder of children may be targeted for attack. We will target sodomites, their organizations, and all those who push their agenda. We will target all facilities and personnel of the federal government. An FBI profiler analyzed the letters and the details of all three bombings. His conclusion, the bomber's real target was law enforcement. Birmingham, Alabama, 11 months after the third Atlanta bombing. Head nurse, Emily Lyons, came to work early that day. Off-duty police officer Robert Sanderson was working there as a security guard. Hey, Sandy. Hey, Emily. How are you doing? Good. We met on the sidewalk in front of the clinic, and we talked for a moment. Then they spotted something that looked out of place. There was an overturned flower pot kind of buried a little bit, and that was not anything we would have ever had. So at that point, Sandy knew something was wrong. Why don't you stand back? Let me check it, OK? All right. The explosion instantly killed security guard Robert Sanderson. Dozens of masonry nails and screws tore through 90% of Emily Lyon's body. Emily lost her left eye. Robert Sanderson had been a Birmingham police officer for eight years. Task force members believed that the bomber had achieved his objective, to murder a law enforcement officer. Forensics later revealed the bomb was triggered by remote control, and that meant the bomber had been there. That increased his chances of killing police officers, but it also directly increased his chances of being identified and caught. Police questioned a witness who saw a man walking away from the scene just after the explosion. When the man removed the wig, the witness became suspicious and followed him. The suspicious man got into a pickup truck. The witness gave the license plate Small number to the police. The gray Nissan truck was traced to a man named Eric Rudolph from North Carolina. A warrant was issued for his arrest. FBI! 
FBI, search for it. Come out with your hands up. An FBI SWAT team raided Rudolph's trailer. Last one's clear. The air conditioner was still running and food was still on the table. Investigators believe they had missed Rudolph by just minutes. He's definitely been here. He told friends and associates when he was a teenager that if he got in trouble with law enforcement, he would disappear into the mountains. And we feel that this is something that he was planning for a long time. After Rudolph's truck was found abandoned near a forest, 250 law enforcement officers converged at the site. But Rudolph had vanished. He grew up in the woods. He knew the terrain much better than we did. And there are places that we knew very well that we could have walked within five feet of him. And uh, we would not have seen him. Eric Rudolph had been raised in a family that reportedly preached white separatism. And he had served in the US Army. He was an experienced outdoorsman and survivalist. I never really heard him talk about positive things. It was a lot of hateful things, a lot of negativity, you know, about, you know, authority and, um, you know, our gun laws and government and politics. George Nordman was a health food store owner who lived in a remote mountain cabin. He had known Rudolph for years. What the hell are you doing here? I need your help, man. When Eric approached him about food stuff, George made the decision not to help Eric, and I believe became somewhat frightened of him. A few nights later, Nordman's home was raided. Several hundred pounds of food and his truck were stolen. It was believed Rudolph had made a return visit. Eric Rudolph was not a joiner. We found no evidence that he ever was a member of a militia. He was someone who had a streak of paranoia about him. Uh, he also liked being alone. So we don't believe that any group is helping him. I think this is a game to him. He wanted to be in Special Forces. He wanted to be a mercenary. He is a one-man army. And he has got the authorities running around looking for him, spending millions of dollars. The survivors of Eric Rudolph's bombs are trying to move on with their lives, but they will never forget. The end for me will be to find him, and it'll be a beginning of a whole nother book, but it'll be an end to that book. And I'll just sign and be like, it's long time coming, long time coming. Update. Five years after Eric Rudolph disappeared, a police officer noticed a suspicious person behind a market in Murphy, North Carolina. Suspecting a burglary, the officer made an arrest. The suspect proved to be none other than Eric Rudolph. He was later convicted for his various bombings and sentenced to four life terms plus 120 years. Next, a trusted executive pulls off a bold theft, $1.3 million in cash. On a previous broadcast, we brought you the story of Brooke Baker, a 21-year-old student at Vincennes College in Indiana. Brooke dreamed of one day becoming a journalist. Can you call me back, please? Because I'm waiting and I need Brooke's her. dream would okay. never come true. She was savagely raped and stabbed to death in her own apartment. Police found no signs that the door had been forced, but there was evidence of a struggle and large amounts of blood. Something else caught their attention, water was left running in the bathtub. Now, it was overflowing. But the most promising clue was a sample of DNA believed to belong to the murderer. Police tested hundreds of people, but failed to identify a suspect. I can't go on with my own life. I can't live without justice for Brooke. 
update. Two years after Brooke Baker's death, police finally got their first break in the case. Sadly, it came at the cost of another life. When the police investigated the apartment of missing college student Erica Elaine Norman, they found a crime scene that was very similar to Brooke Baker's. There was water running in the bathtub, and I knew right then that it was the same person who had committed the, the murder of Brooke Baker. Erica had last been seen leaving a local restaurant with a man by the name of Brian Jones. Jones was immediately brought in for questioning. When we interviewed Brian Jones, it turned out that uh, he was a roommate of an individual that was uh, seeing Brooke Baker at, within the last couple weeks of her death. Brian Jones' DNA linked him conclusively to the murder of Brooke Baker. After his arrest, he also admitted to murdering Erica Norman. Brian presented himself to me as someone that would have not stopped. Uh, it's tragic that we lost a, a second young girl, but that case stopped a serial killer, in my opinion. Brian Jones was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. One Saturday morning, an executive named Jack Quinn turned his back on his company and his family. He disappeared with more than a million dollars in company funds, and now police need your help to track him down. Hi, Bob. Hey, Jack, how you doing? Pretty Jack fun, Quinn was the vice president of a bank security company. Every day, the firm handled millions of dollars in cash. How about that raise, Jack? We spoke about. On a normal Saturday morning, Quinn arrived at his office early, as usual. Only his supervisor, Harry Goldberg, was working that morning. Morning, Harry. Morning, Jack. I'm going to take care of the morning run. OK. While Harry worked at his desk, Quinn was busy, too. From time to time, Harry would see Quinn in the vault, but noticed nothing unusual. I'd walk down the hall several times, pick up coffee or whatever, and every time I'd go past that window, I'd look in and see him sitting at the desk, just as calm, cool, and collected as you'd ever want to see him. I never suspected he would be doing something like that. I don't even know how he had the time. Somehow, without being noticed, Quinn spent most of the morning in the vault, transferring the money from bags to boxes. Quinn put the money in the trunk of his company car. He also put $107,000 into the trunk of his personal car. He then asked Harry Goldberg to follow him home. When he arrived, Quinn dropped off his car and said goodbye to his wife. Nothing, I have to get back to the office. I'll be about a half hour or so, OK? Sure. See you. Harry Goldberg drove Quinn back to the office. Quinn got into the company car that now held over a million dollars and headed to the airport. Police guessed that he had transferred the money into suitcases. When he arrived at the airport, he unloaded his car and vanished. The trail for Quinn stops at Palm Beach International Airport. From that point, we have no idea where Mr. Quinn has gone. Indications are he did not take a plane, he did not rent a car, and he did not take a cab. Jack dropped the car keys off to me a while ago, and he said he'd be back in half an hour. And that was five hours ago. When her husband didn't come home that evening, Quinn's wife called his office. They had no idea where he was or what he had done. The next morning, she found the $107,000 in the trunk of their car. She turned it in to the police. She also found a letter that read in part, I have done something very wrong and I can't stay and face the consequences. The monies that Quinn left with that Saturday night are untraceable. There are no pre-recorded serial numbers. There are no bait bills. 
The monies are of a varied denomination and basically could never be traced to him. It appears that Quinn may have been involved in several what we call defalcations, missing money, mysterious disappearances from the company. There was an incident approximately a month prior to his leaving where his wife had found a wad of money in his personal vehicle, and it was unexplained. Whenever the wife would find money, be it in the car, in the house, Quinn would explain it away as he had sold something, a gun, a car, sold property, and that would explain his acclimation of the money. In their investigation, police learned that Quinn had once been suspected of stealing $70,000 at another firm before he'd come to work at Federal Protection. He underwent a lie detector test to prove his innocence. The test was inconclusive. Several weeks prior to this theft, uh, we learned that the IRS was after Jack Quinn to settle a substantial amount of money. And it was quite obvious to me that the reason he pulled this job is because he was going to lose everything or possibly go to jail. There were reports that Quinn was having an ongoing affair. A month prior to the theft, Quinn would leave home at 5 a.m., yet not arrive at work until 9.30. Police speculate that he used the time to see his girlfriend. They also speculate that they may have run away together. Criminal prosecution, an IRS inquiry, a secret love affair. For whatever reason he fled, Jack Quinn is a wanted man. Quinn is stocky with a tendency to put on weight. He has thinning brown hair, brown eyes, and is fluent in Spanish. Authorities believe he may now be living somewhere in Hawaii or near Baltimore, Maryland. He may be using the name Calvin Clucky. If you have any information about Jack Quinn, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.